This video is a list of my least favorite card tricks. But it has nothing to do with negativity. In fact, I'm going to share how thinking about the worst card tricks has shaped the way I think about the rest of my magic, and how I can help you think about yours. Academic research has already shown us that card tricks are the most forgettable type of magic, so it's really important that when we perform with the pasteboards, we put our best foot forward. I've already done a video with my favorite card plots, but it's time that we look at the bottom of the barrel. I should note that these tricks are not devoid of anything positive or good, they just seem to fall flat in my hands. In other words, it's harder to make these into something interesting for me. And maybe it's just the versions that I know, so if while you're watching this, you have a version that you think is great and you've put a lot of thought into it, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. Regardless, I think that it's imperative that we look at our work critically. If we assume that everyone will love everything we do, we will never improve. We should solicit outside opinions about whether the work that we do is our best work or just the work that makes us feel comfortable. At number five on my list of the worst card tricks is the ubiquitous ambitious card routine. You might be thinking, why is this so bad? And in truth, it's really not a terrible effect on its own. But it very quickly loses steam via repetition. In magic, in show business, in life in general, we want to leave them wanting more. And too many times, this trick just goes on too long. But beyond that, there's no real reason that your participants should be invested in what you're doing. And this leads to the question, how are we presenting it? Which is a key question in any magic trick. If your presentation is about one card, an ambitious card, then why is your participant drawn to it? And if this is your lead-off card trick and you're presenting this as the card that just keeps wanting to come to the top of the deck, then in subsequent card routines, why isn't that a recurring theme? Why doesn't that card continue to rise to the top after the ambitious card routine is over? The bottom line in the solution that I came to, or the way this made me think about my magic, is that you have to make your audience care. We have to be able to answer the question, so what? And this is a really tough question to ask yourself, especially if you're willing to be honest with the reply. But it will yield so much fruit if you take the time to answer it thoughtfully, introspectively, and honestly. And I don't want to leave you hanging if you like the ambitious card routine. One of the versions that I think has some pretty good things going for it is David Regal's The Puppy Trick. The plot kind of makes sense, at least more so than a card that has some sort of personality that wants to come to the top of the deck. If nothing else, at least this version has their imagination as the star of the show, and there's a very slight emotional investment from your participants. The point is here that scripting and presentation matters when it comes to getting your audience to care. Number four on my list of worst card magic plots is the sandwich effect. Frankly, it just doesn't seem that magical. Too many versions have the magic happening within the darkness and confines of the deck where you really can't see what's happening anyway. And there's really just not that much magic going on at all. When you summarize the trick in one sentence, it sounds a little something like this. A participant's card gets reversed between two other random cards. Or worse yet, a participant's card gets reversed between two detectives in the deck. In the end, it's essentially a card location using two other cards, or more if you're doing a collector's routine. It's slightly more magical than just a find your participant's card, but you're still left ultimately with the question, why should they care? And what difference does it make about these two other cards? So what did I learn out of this? I thought that it was somewhat helpful to think about the category of the magic effect that you're trying to convey to your audience. As I mentioned on its own, it's just a location, which is basically one of the weakest magic effects you can have. The best versions of this plot have more to do with a transposition, which is more magical. This leads to a distance between the two cards that will sandwich the participant's selection. So the further they are away from the rest of the deck for a longer period of time, the more magical this transposition seems. And at risk of sounding like the David Regal show, David has at least one great version that puts quite a bit of distance between the sandwich cards and the selection in his excellent book, Approaching Magic. So the lesson here is to think about the effect and see if you can move that effect into a higher ranked magical bracket with just some presentation and scripting. Number three on my list is oil and water. This is another trick like the ambitious card routine that really only works with repetition. 
people see it the first time and assume they weren't paying close enough attention, so you offer to repeat it. However, when you repeat it, it's largely the exact same thing you did the first time. In other words, this repetition does not move the ball forward. And the most exciting part of the trick, typically the climax where, say, the entire deck has separated into red and black, really could be done in almost any other card trick. Basically any trick where the deck is shuffled a number of times and reverts back to new deck order. And one could argue that something like new deck order makes more sense than just the reds and the blacks separating. I think part of the problem with this trick is that we've done ourselves a disservice with the way this was named initially. We've always thought about it as this oil and water, give it some time and they'll separate. But that premise doesn't really even make any sense because if that were the case, everyone's deck of cards that they got from the drugstore or Walmart would already be separated. If we're asking our participants to suspend their disbelief, it just isn't logical. So what can we learn from this? To me, magic should have a natural progression. And if you repeat something, there should be a reason. Each new phase should add something to either the difficulty or preferably even make something more magical. And whatever your premise, it should convince people to suspend their disbelief. Frankly speaking, I don't really have a favorite version of this. This is just a plot that has always left me completely cold. So if you have a suggestion or a version that you like that overcomes some of these obstacles that we're discussing, sound off down in the comments below. Number two on my list of worst card tricks are dealing location tricks. These are almost always the first tricks we learn, and there's probably a reason for that. One is that they're basically self-working, and two, they're more interesting to the performer than to anyone else, since they basically work themselves. The 21 card trick is the poster child of this type of effect, although it's not exclusively limited to that particular presentation. We've all done it and there's no shame in starting somewhere, but it really just isn't that interesting. Ultimately, there's too much process for too little payoff. And if you're going to have a process, it needs to have a reason. For example, why do they need to deal the cards? And in this case, the reason not only points to the method, it is the method, which is the weakest of all magic effects. So how do we solve this or what do we do about it? Well, one thing is to put the cards into their hands. That doesn't completely solve this because in the 21 card trick, of course, that is happening. But I'm a firm believer that the more you can get your participant involved, the better off it is because they're going to feel like the magic is happening in their hands. But more than that, we need to give some sort of reason for the dealing, something beyond just, well, you have to do it to make the card trick work. And I think a great example of this is Jim Steinmeier's nine card problem. You're not dealing with a lot of cards, so there's not a ton of dealing, and there's a whole liar or truth teller presentation that gives the participants something to think about. Would they lie about this? Would they tell the truth? And in the end, they're finding their own card in their own hands, and it's much more magical than dealing cards into three different piles and then identifying which card is theirs. Numero uno on my least favorite card magic plots are story tricks. Let me make a differentiation here. I'm not talking about excellent demonstrations of skill like Bill Malone's Sam the Bellhop. Rather, I'm talking about hackneyed presentations where the cards are metaphors of some sort of personality. Unless this style of presentation is played for laughs, it's really hard to take it seriously. If you're pretending like the cards are whispering to you or telling you things, or that they have distinctive personalities, this might work for Alice in Wonderland but it's not nearly as charming when it's performed by a magician. And again, you're going to see more of this being typical for a beginner in magic. We all did the trick with the four jacks as the four bank robbers with an elevator card finish. But even more intermediate students sometimes tend to get caught up into these fanciful presentations with story-driven characters from a deck. So what do we see in this? To me, story can be important, and I think it's very important to give your audience something to resonate with, but I don't think that it should be driven from the props themselves. In fact, I think that the story should revolve around you or your participants. So maybe it could be an interesting experience that you had. Tell a story about something you've done, and preferably make it a real one, not about how you were playing in a card game and this guy was missing fingers or whatever. Unless, of course, that's really happened to you. But you can also ask your participant questions and get them involved in your presentations. I've already given a couple examples of this with David Regal's puppy trick and Jim Steinmeier's nine card problem. But above all, 
be interesting. Using cards as personality seems like the lazy way out. So with this, my least favorite presentation, it taught me to think beyond the obvious. Because the obvious presentation is often the most boring. And we certainly don't want to be known for being boring. Ultimately, when we wrap this up and we look at all five of these tricks, what have we learned? My key takeaway is that I should pick tricks and presentations that work for me and my personality. And obviously, none of these five work very well for me, even though I hope some version of them works well for you and want to hear about it. I hope that these tricks and some of my takeaways will help you. But if you'd rather see my top five card trick plots that will give you a leg up in your presentations, be sure to check out that video here. As always, my friends, I appreciate you watching. And until next time, keep reading.